I'd like to introduce now uh, somebody to come and introduce our, who's going to introduce our next speaker, who is, of course, our next guest of honor. Uh, this gentleman has been a supporter of the, of the Lion Rock Institute for quite some time. He has a very long and illustrious career. Uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, he was recently the chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce, where he not only represented uh, very ably the interests of the British business community in Hong Kong, uh, but also kind of brought, I think, you know, from, from what I could see and from going to their events, he brought some of, of some of that free market ideas back into that, that particular organization and chamber and reminded the business people there of how they benefited from free markets and the importance of it, and of course the British contribution to free markets starting all the way back from you know, the thinking of people like Adam Smith. He is currently the chairman of Link REIT, um, and he's going to introduce our keynote speaker, and there are two things about them that they have in common. One I knew before I got here, and one uh, we, the two of them discovered as they sat together. Uh, one, this uh, next person we have coming, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of quality film. If you are a film buff, you want to have a conversation with this guy. And the other thing is that both he and our keynote speakers were once uh, school teachers uh, for the uh, K-12, uh, so not university professors, but actual honest-to-God school teachers. So I'd like to have come up and introduce our guest of honor. Could you please help me welcome our introducer, who is, of course, the chairman of Linkrete, Mr. Nick Salno-Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Andrew explained earlier that his name is Work. I think my name should be redundant. <laughs> uh, because earlier on, Andrew already introduced the Financial Secretary. So I now have to delay the Financial Secretary's speech by introducing him again, uh, which I'm going to do. Um, now, of course, it's common on occasions like this, first of all, to say that this person needs no introduction, and then to spend 10 minutes introducing him. Um, so I'm going to spend two minutes introducing him because you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to him. Um, we've had a lot of good stuff about Hong Kong said uh, tonight, which is right. Uh, but we started the evening talking about absolute decline and relative good performance. And I think it's worth talking about the financial secretary in this context. Because to me... Uh, John is the thinking man's politician. Uh, whenever you're listening to him or talking to him, you know that he's not repeating a dogma of policy. He's been thinking about why the policy is what it is. And that's pretty important, and it's in short supply in Hong Kong, shorter than it perhaps ought to be. But there's a bigger and longer trajectory here. Um, I don't know how many people here wrote, wrote, read the Richard Wong article in the Post this morning, which was rather timely. And, and Richard was writing about the traditions of freedom in Hong Kong uh, in a very eloquent way, as he always does. And he was alluding to the fact that our ability to stay top of Fred's index is wonderful, but uh, it's a conflicted ability that at least until uh, since the Macleho's days, maybe earlier, but I'm not sure, but at least since those days, within Hong Kong, there's been a socialist free market tension, uh, which obviously in Macleho's days was related to the, the governor and the financial secretaries of those days. And maybe in every country in the world there's this tension between the wish of the population to do good stuff, as Fred was talking about, and the realization that the way of creating the wealth to do the, that good stuff is free markets. And what we need in this room to understand is the hugely important role our financial secretary has played in the years he's been in that position and earlier positions uh, in maintaining that tension. And, and I find it remarkable that he's done that. Um, I haven't said anything about his history, but, but most of you know in this room that, that he, he went to Boston State and he went to Harvard and he studied government, how you run governments. And then after a brief interlude came back and has been in the civil service here for over 30 years. So you might expect somebody 
who is a quintessential bureaucrat to look at it in a much more formulaic way than he does. But the consequence of the way he's thought about this is that that creative tension in favor of openness and markets and freedoms in Hong Kong, which has to be supported within the administration, one of the key reasons that that is still supported and we are still in such great shape here is our financial secretary. And it's important for those of us in this room who don't like some of the taxes and stuff on property. And, and of course we don't, and we have to say all of that. But we do need to remember what we owe John in his term of office here in maintaining that tension and making sure that the administration doesn't slide in the way it does in many other parts of the world into what I think is quaintly called populist policies. So with that said, perhaps you join your hands together and welcome the person who's helped us maintain our position more than anybody in Hong Kong, the Financial Secretary, John Jung. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, Peter, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is indeed my great pleasure to join you all at this evening's Lion Rock Institute Economic Freedom of the World annual dinner, a special occasion where we get together to celebrate that utopian concept that we so aspire to reach and to affirm also the power of the free market that sustains the miracle of the world's freest economy, the miracle of Hong Kong. The open secret behind the remarkable rise as well as the continuing success of our own home economy is according to the words of the Lion Rock Institute, our passionate and firm belief of that potential of the individual and free market values. Yes, we do take pride in our achievements in realizing and safeguarding economic freedom. We do take pride in Hong Kong's own brand of economic success, which is quite unlike the fabrication sort of neighboring pretenders. So it is immensely satisfying to learn that with our collective efforts to promote economic freedom continuing to be recognized by a raft of like-minded international institutions, we are remaining on the right track. Earlier this year, the Washington-based Heritage Foundation named Hong Kong the world's freest economy for the 21st year in a row. And in September, uh, Hong Kong topped the annual Economic Freedom of the World report published by the Cato Institute and the Vancouver-based Fraser Institute. Hong Kong has done so, by the way, as Fred has mentioned, every year since the report first came out in 1996. So it is great, as always, to welcome Fred back again to this evening's gathering. Fred is, of course, as you know, the representative of the Fraser Institute. And thank you for your institute's appreciation and recognition of our hard work and persistent adherence in upholding free market principles. As Financial Secretary, I can tell you, it is a great honor to top, the ri to top that list during my watch. But it is not an easy task, as Fred has also mentioned in one of his slides, to stay on top year after year. There are just so many temptations for us to take the easy route to get on the populist freeway. And that's why it requires a continuing and steadfast commitment to free market principles from everyone concerned in our community to fortify that achievement and resist going to the dark side. Indeed, Hong Kong's free market philosophy has been the foundation stone in the formulation of our public policies, in the sustainability of our economic stability and prosperity, and in the well-being of the Hong Kong society at large. We keep government intervention in the economy to the minimum. Only when the market fails to operate properly in very special circumstances would the government exert its influence. 
Individuals and companies in Hong Kong are free to engage in economic activities of their own choosing and to realize rewards based on their efforts, based on their ability, and perhaps on some occasions, their luck of the draw. In Hong Kong, it is the invisible hand of the market which allocates the valuable finite resources and picks the rightful winners. It is even more important now than ever to allow the market to run the entire gamut because businesses today are facing unprecedented challenges from the competitors from every corner of the earth in the increasingly globalized and interconnected world economy. The potential customers and competitors alike are all just a click of the mouse away. In order to remain competitive, businesses need to adjust swiftly and flexibly, maximizing the efficiency according to market principles in attaining the hard-earned income. We are working diligently, too, to ensure that practices in Hong Kong continue to align with the spirit of economic freedom and the well-tested free market principles. And in the next few minutes, let me share with you how we are faring on the various fronts, or to be exact, in the five areas which Fred has mentioned, which the Fraser Institute employs to measure the extent of freedom of an economy. And they are, I'll repeat, the size of government, legal system and property rights, regulations, freedom to trade internationally, and access to sound money. Let me begin with the size of government. I'm happy to say that Hong Kong ranks first in this area in the Institute's 2015 report on economic freedom. I always believe, personally, that the private sector, with its flexibility and knowledge of the market, would be way smarter than the public sector when it comes to the allocation of scarce resources. They should be able to make more effective as well as efficient use of the limited resources that are available. I always consider also that governments should take only what they need to maintain the essential services and to develop the major infrastructure that would help sustain and facilitate the long-term growth of the economy. Maintaining a small public sector allows us to sustain a simple and low tax regime. According to the study, Paying Taxes 2015, undertaken by PwC for the World Bank on the East of Paying Taxes, Hong Kong ranked fourth in the world among 189 economies, with Singapore coming in fifth. With our maximum salaries tax set at 15%, and our profits tax rate at a flat 16.5%, the total tax rate they have estimated for Hong Kong stood at 22.8%, as compared with the world average of 40.9%. It took 78 hours, according to the study, for the Hong Kong company to file all the necessary tax returns. The world average was 264 hours. I'm a little surprised that it takes more than three whole days for Hong Kong companies to file the tax return, even though it's still very low compared with the world average. It usually takes me almost five minutes to do mine every year. <laughs> but perhaps that has to do with my income. <laughs> After we have collected all the taxes from your good selves, and thank you very much, government will spend no more than 20% of our GDP to provide the, com the community with the necessary services, leaving the great majority of our gross domestic products, some 80%, to the private sector to undertake initiatives in fulfilling the aspirations and visions. In fact, it is explicitly promulgated in the basic law that we have to keep our budget commensurate with economic growth <coughs> while keeping a low tax regime. In light of our commitment to a low tax regime, we need to maintain the straightest fiscal discipline in government's expenditure and in planning for our economic future. We have witnessed the hard lessons learned from the bitter experience of the many advanced economies that high public debt means relegation of the burden to future generations and truncating their freedom to consume. It means forcing them to be frugal 
in order to repay the debt accumulated by previous generations. To date, our fiscal position remains healthy. We have been able to have surpluses every year during my term as financial secretary so far, and we are virtually debt free. But that, however, will become an increasingly difficult plan to hold given our enhanced spending and rapidly aging population. As the baby boomers get older and our labor force becomes smaller, the problem will become more apparent. In fact, our labor force will start declining from 2018 very soon, dampening our economic vibrancy. No less of a concern, the aging population will drive up demand for health care as well as social welfare challenging our long-term fiscal outlook. So we need to plan ahead in order to help alleviate or simply to lessen the pressure on our future generations. We need to put in place measures to contain the growth of, of expenditure. We need to ensure that we can achieve value for money in our spending. We need to conduct fiscal sustainability assessments on new major initiatives. We need to seek better returns from longer-term investments of our resources. We need to put in place all these initiatives and move to secure a firmer foundation on which future generations can operate. The second area of assessment is the rule of law, another indispensable building block of our sustained success. Our legal structure provides a rather robust framework of protection for all the entities in Hong Kong. And these laws, which are constantly under review to ensure that they serve their intended purposes amid changing circumstances, have been rather effectively enforced by relevant government agencies. And to uphold the rule of law, it is equally important that the judiciary remains independent of the other branches of government. And that is exactly the guarantee enshrined in the basic law and jealously guarded in Hong Kong. The rule of law, as you are all aware, is also fearlessly and rigorously protected by our hugely vocal media, local and international. The regulation of credit, labor, and business is the next area of consideration. This is another aspect that Hong Kong ranks first uh, in the Institute's uh, 2015 report. We are proud to have a transparent, fair, and predictable regulatory regime. All persons, businesses, and organizations, regardless of their nationality, are treated exactly the same. Every business in Hong Kong can enjoy the same privilege. They can enjoy the same benefits provided by our international <coughs> agreements. On the other hand, we are constantly reviewing our regulations with a view to reducing unnecessary red tape and eliminating outdated and spent processes. That serves to enhance our efficiency and reduce compliance costs for our business. We are also constantly searching for ways to further improve the business environment in Hong Kong. I believe that government does have an important role to play as market facilitator in maintaining a favorable business environment and ensuring the operation of a level playing field for everyone in our markets. I know some of you fundamentalists, Peter, out there would take issue with that, but that's fine. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Another key area is freedom to trade. As a free port and an open market, we are naturally a staunch supporter of free trade. We impose zero tariffs and no tariff barriers. I was surprised to learn from Fred that we have problems with non-tariff barriers, and I certainly Helen will look into that. <laughs> Traders in all sectors and from all jurisdictions can trade freely here in Hong Kong. That makes us one of the largest trading economies in the world, according to the WTO. Hong Kong also actively participates in various international forums to expound on the benefits of free trade and to explore trade-enabling initiatives with other economies. Our status as one of the world's best trading platforms is clearly recognized. Hong Kong offers also unparalleled connectivity for multilateral businesses, of multinational businesses and corporations. We're within five hours flying time 
of half the world's population. And each day, some 1,100 flights arrive at and depart from Hong Kong. And we have one of the finest international airports in the world. According to the latest data released just last week, the number of business operations in Hong Kong with parent companies overseas and in the mainland has climbed to a new record of some 8,000 in 2015, an increase of four, over 4% 4 uh, year on year. And together with free trade is the free flow of capital. Our external trade is equivalent to more than four times our GDP. And the massive flow of funds through Hong Kong day in and day out fuels a wide spectrum of financial activities. As the UN World Investment Report 2015 suggests, Hong Kong for the first time came second in global foreign direct investment with record amounts of inflows and outflows at 103 billion US dollars and 143 billion US dollars respectively. On this note, it helps enormously to maintain a simple, credible and transparent monetary regime. Our link exchange rate system has stood the test of time, having been in place and working effectively for Hong Kong since October 1983. I value highly the hard-earned credibility of our monetary system. Clearly, free market principles have served Hong Kong well, and they will continue to do so. But for the Hong Kong economy to reach new heights, we must continue to seize fresh opportunities. Opportunities that I have in mind don't get any fresher, any larger or more promising than the visionary and ambitious concept of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative spearheaded by Presidency in 2013. Created with connectivity at its heart, this grand and far-reaching scheme seeks to enhance ties in infrastructure, in trade and investment, in culture and more, among some 60-plus economies spanning Asia, Europe, as well as Africa. More importantly, the initiative presents the world with an abundance of business opportunities in an unprecedented way. And I think it has all it takes to become the much needed driving force of the lackluster world economy in this 21st century. Under the initiative, we envisage soaring infrastructure investment, deepening financial integration, expanding trade flows, and growing people-to-people -people bonds. Hong Kong, with our unique advantages under the One Country, Two Systems framework, has all it takes from our world-class market infrastructure and professionals to the robust legal system and the unparalleled business network to play a central role in delivering fully the enormous possibilities presented by the Belt and Road Initiative. We shall do all we can to fast-track the future that we see in the Belt and Road Initiative through our efforts on the G2G level in promoting closer ties and deeper understanding with potential partner economies along the Belt and Row, in particular those emerging economies that dominate the landscape. We shall also step up our efforts in signing bilateral agreements with economies to expand trade and investment flows while helping Hong Kong companies better understand the economic realities and regulatory requirements in these new markets. So ladies and gentlemen, that's actually a pretty long way for me to say that government will remain a passionate supporter of free trade principles. That's exactly all I wanted to say, which are Lion Rock Institute principles. And as Nelson Mandela once said, action without vision is only passing time. Vision without action is merely daydreaming, but vision with action can change the world. We have the vision, a vision that we share, a vision that requires us to safeguard our core values, to sustain our effective policies, and to preserve our unswerving commitment to free market principles for long-term benefits that can be enjoyed by you, by me, by our children, grandchildren by Hong Kong. Finally, I wish you all the best of business in the coming year, and may the force of the free market be with you. Thank you.
Um, we'd like to have a little toast. Um, and first of all, John, thank you very much for that speech. Very, uh, and with, with that finish, you know, with the new Star Wars movie coming out, you're right on topic. Fantastic. You must be as excited as I am about it. <laughs> um, we'd like to welcome now our other uh, guest uh, speaker today, Mr. Fred McBone, our current chairman, Mr. Peter Wong, our past chairman, Bill Stacy, and all of our friends from the head table to come and join us on stage for a toast with our two guest speakers. If you could please come and join us. Um, I hope our friends at the Harbor Grand are passing some drinks out. Hopefully you haven't finished yours during our, our, our presentations. There you go, Dan. Yeah, don't ruin the picture, Dan. And there we go. To my right, the other member of our board who has not gotten a mention in yet tonight is Dan Ryan, our legal eagle on the board of the uh, Lion Rock Institute, who's recently moved to Australia and is now involved in founding a new organization there called Australian, Australian, Australian in Progress. Progress. Australian Institute of Progress. There we go. Thank you very much. And rare for me not to have a drink in my hand. But there it is. There we go. So once again, thank you very much to our guest speakers. Thank you to everyone for coming here. And a toast to freedom, freedom in Hong Kong, and the future of our great city. To freedom. freedom. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.